I believe that karakia is said to be not just for the person up the front, but for all of us to say it together. So we'll say it really slow in case you trip over it. But join me in saying this. Kia tau te rangi marie, o te rangi e tūne, o papatūnaku e te kotone, o te taia e hafine, ki ronga i a tātou. May the peace of the sky above, of the earth below, and the world all around us rest upon us. That's a great beginning, isn't it? Thank you very much. We're going to hand straight over to Julianne, our very own Minister of Women, Associate Minister of Transport and Health. I don't know how she keeps on top of which hat she's wearing particular time, but it's fantastic to have you here in Christchurch, Julianne, so over to you. Thank you. It is so amazing to be here in Christchurch. Three months ago to the day I flew back from Christchurch to Wellington, after a transportation conference. And that was the last flight I took until this morning when I flew back to Christchurch. And isn't it wonderful <laughs> to be at level one? Woo! Woo I just wanna say congratulations to all of us for what we've achieved. Um, it's truly phenomenal. And speaking to my friends and family who live in other countries, Everyone is incredibly envious of what Aotearoa New Zealand has achieved. Of course, we have to keep up the vigilance, but it's really amazing that we can be back at level one. So thank, thanks to every single one of you who um, stayed at home and saved lives. Um, I thought it would be useful to have this conversation because, firstly, the whole reason I got involved in politics is because I'm passionate about towns and cities, and I can imagine towns and cities where a 12-year-old can get around, totally independent, meet up with their friends, go to school, uh, go to the park, go to see their friends, and not feel endangered. In fact, that's how it used to be. And I think that if we could all live in towns and cities where the most vulnerable young people could get on a bike, and get around and not be in danger from traffic, we would all benefit from that. And I think Christchurch has shown us just what can be achieved when you put some resource into safe, separated cycleways, because we've seen a huge increase in the number of people using bicycles for short trips, and we've seen a huge increase in the number of women who are choosing to use bicycles Woo! for short trips. <laughs> and this is this is not insignificant. 41% of the people using bikes in Christchurch now are women. The national average in New Zealand has been something around 25 or 30%. And if you go over to Europe, uh, places like the Netherlands, Germany, Copenhagen, where they have really purpose-built infrastructure for people to get around on bikes, slightly more than half of the people using bikes are women. So we know that when we make it safe enough for lots of women to use bicycles, they do. And indeed, many, many more people use bicycles. And when many more people in the city are using bicycles, that means they're not in single occupant cars, which means that you have less congestion, uh, you have less need for all that off-street car parking, um, you have quieter streets, when they are oriented around bicycles and people walking. And of course, all of that needs to be augmented by frequent public transport, and I know that's something that we could do a lot better in Christchurch. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if we, the thing with transport, and when I worked as a transport planner, I realized this, is whatever you build for is what you will get. And for about 50 years or more, we only really built for cars. And that meant we just kept getting more and more cars. And the cost of that for our towns and cities is really, really high. And we'll always have trouble with congestion. We'll always have households who aren't able to access as much of the city because the cost of owning and running a car is much higher 
than the cost of owning a bicycle. Um, so the thing with cars is they're incredibly useful when you want to go up to the mountain, or if you want to go out to the beach, or if you have to take a large group of people to a particular destination, or if you're moving house. I mean, some people move house on cargo bikes, that's true. But um, cars can be really useful, but if they're the only mode of transport available to people, they kind of ruin your city, they cost a lot of money, they're bad for the climate, they're bad for air and water pollution as well, and we don't have to just provide that. In fact, I would say we have a uh, moral obligation to make sure that we've provided the alternatives and the safe alternatives, especially for the youngest members of our communities who aren't going to be able to drive cars until they're at least 16, and then they might not be able to afford one. So earlier today, I was at the launch of uh, Lockheed Dock Stations. How many of you have heard about Lockheed Docks? A lot of people. Okay, well that's really good because it only just opened today. But basically there's 10 of these stations and there's going to be a network of more of them. Uh, they're a place where you can lock your bike for free if you have the app. It's secure bike parking for, particularly good for e-bikes because you can charge your e-bikes. And they have a, like a um, digital billboard which is changing and it shows the safe cycling routes uh, throughout the city and it also has other useful community messages. So it's, it's a community asset that's there um, for you to use, especially if you have a bike or an e-bike, you'll find that useful. Uh, look up Lockie Dock, L-O-C-K-Y, D-O-C-K, or uh, search Big Street Bikers and you'll find out about them. Look out for them around town. They've got bright pink uh, kind of lock thing. And it's like a thing for about 10 or 15 bikes can slot in there. So, um, and the whole idea behind this and driven by this group, the Big Street Bikers, is really making visible and making a useful kind of community hub um, around bicycles and e-bikes in particular, because electric bicycles make it possible for even more people to use bicycles for more trips. And that's really the quiet revolution that is currently happening in our towns and cities. Bike sales, and particularly e-bikes, are booming. Not just here in New Zealand, around the world. And it's particularly women and people over the age of 65 who are interested in e-bikes. Um, and so that's suddenly making a bicycle a much more useful uh, tool for many more people. And again, we all benefit from that. So, um, so this quiet revolution, I think, is one that we in government want to embrace because it ticks so many boxes. It meets so many of our goals as a community and as a country. Uh, we've committed to reducing our carbon pollution and the majority of that, the carbon pollution, so there's greenhouse gases, um, some of which is from agriculture, about half of it, but the majority of our carbon pollution is from transport. And the majority of that is from cars uh, SUVs, utes, and so we really need to provide those better alternatives for the short trips people make every day around town. There's no way that a bike is going to work for every person or every trip, and I would never pretend that is the case. But it's going to work better if those people who can cycle and who want to cycle are able to do that safely. That does more to free up our road network and make it work better, particularly outside the city centre than anything we could do that's just oriented around cars. And um, in government, I think we have started to take the steps that we need to, to support communities to have more choices in how they get around. We've done that through our government policy statement on transport, which has identified uh, more funding for public transport, more funding available for rapid transit, and I'm really keen to see uh, what we could do in the medium term for Christchurch Otutahi. Like, what is our long-term vision for this uh, community, this area? What, what is, it, what is the, the next step in, develop, in actually building a public transport network that works for people in this region? 
Um, and we've also put a lot of money into road safety, a big focus on safety and safe speeds, particularly around schools. And all of that is necessary to enable the members of our community to have more choice in how they get around. And ultimately, in giving them those choices they haven't had for the last 50 to 70 years, um, we will create much more sustainable, thriving, healthy, happy towns and cities. And I say, is that, is that something you would want? Yeah. Yep. Yes. <laughs> And there's a lot that needs to be done in land use planning, urban design. We're going to hear from one of our panelists later tonight about urban design in Christchurch as well as transport. Those two things go hand in hand. Providing affordable housing is really important, but not just houses, right? And people need to live in a community where they have options to access the things they need. Shops, they need schools for their kids. Uh, they need health centers and general practice, dentists, they need community centers where the community can come together for the various things that they're interested in, and they need jobs and they need a place to work. And so we want to make sure that going forward, the urban development that we're seeing is providing those complete communities and putting those sustainable transport options in from the beginning. And all of that is far more affordable and achievable than continuing to do what we've always done, which is build the houses way out there in the subdivision. You can't get anywhere you know, in 10 or 15 minutes walk, except maybe your neighbors. So you have to get in the car, you have to get on the highway, you have to drive into town, then there's the traffic jam, then there's the endless need for parking, maybe you have to pay for the parking, you've got a big petrol bill at the end of the week, that's the exact opposite of what we want to do. And while I totally accept and understand that some people may want to live in a place where you can only drive to, right now we haven't provided an alternative to the same extent. So all of the new development we're doing, there's an opportunity to provide those mixed use neighborhoods, affordable housing, and much more people oriented streets. And we all know the benefit of that. So I'd say we've taken some good steps in government and I'm quite happy to answer questions, um, but I know I'm running short on time. So um, I'm interested to know what you want to hear about, but I think that post COVID-19, we have an opportunity to accelerate the trend that was already happening. When people all stayed at home and were in their neighborhoods, we had quiet streets. People could hear the birds. They felt safe to get out there on their bike and to go out walk. You saw families traveling together. How do we keep those good things at that time as we rebuild? How do we make sure we're providing the things that people need to thrive in a way that enables us to keep those quiet streets, that bird song, that safety, that ability to stay local when we feel like it and be safe? And I think we've got a huge opportunity to do that as we move into the next term of government. We're going to invite our other two panelists to come up. Axel Wilkie is a transport planner and a friend, actually, and traffic engineer at Via Strata. Um, so it's great to have you here, Axel, and maybe um, Claire, you can come up front too. Oh, yes. No, um, and Claire Piper is the Otatahi Network founder of Women and Urbanism in Aotearoa. So they're just going to speak for a little while each, and then um, we'll have some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ross Murray. Kia ora, everyone. So my name's Axel, as Ross Murray said, and um, I'm a traffic engineer and transport planner. I've been around uh, for almost a quarter of a century now in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, always here in, uh, in Christchurch. and. Uh, and for a few years, Julianne and I, we were industry colleagues, uh, and uh, yeah, so things have moved on, uh, I suppose. <laughs> so I'll talk about um, livable cities. We've just had one, haven't we? During the lockdown, the streets were full of people walking, whole family cycling. And people absolutely loved it. And then we came out of lockdown, and the streets emptied of people. So what 
do we want from our future? I suggest what we want is a livable city where it's easy and safe to get to where you want to go, free of pollution, so that the next generation can experience the same. So how are we doing? I touch on cycling, on public transport, and driving. As uh, Julianne has already touched on, cycling is going right in Christchurch. Double digit growth year after year. Our city council is doing um, the right thing. And uh, thank you. We've got a couple of city councillors here, so uh, give them a. Public transport, on the other hand, is our problem child. It's organized by the regional council, but whether it's successful relies heavily on what the city council does do or doesn't do. People use public transport that's reliable. Bus lanes is what achieves reliability, and bus lanes are the responsibility of the city council. People use public transport if it's convenient. But if parking is cheap, or free, or plentiful, they are much more likely to drive. Want full buses? Then the city council has to charge for parking. What did the city council do recently? They abolished parking charges. Which, by the way, doesn't help any retailer if it's organized in, the, in a way that the free parks are taken up by commuters. The biggest threat to our future is, I suggest, climate change. I suggest to you, we will not get on top of the climate change issue if we focus on cycling or public transport. No, if we want to change behavior in a way that is meaningful, we have to be much more explicit and the correct goal is to reduce driving. Spell it out. We want fewer people to drive. If we achieve that, everything else works better and becomes easy. Buses are fast and reliable. Walking and cycling is safer and feels the right thing to do. Clean air, quiet streets, but so no congestion. So what are the most effective levers? Decreased road capacity. For example, take a four-lane road, convert it into a two-lane road, and have room for two bus lanes. Reduce speed limits. Speeds above 30 k an hour are much less safe. So why not have 30 k speed limits area-wide, across the whole city, in all the suburbs? Thirdly, reduce on-street parking. Charge for those parks that remain. At the very least, everywhere where there's high parking demand. They do that in Queenstown, and with the income, they fund a much improved bus service, and they have more bus use in Queenstown on a per population basis than we have in Christchurch. And on a national level, I suggest we, stop, we put a stop to importing light vehicles with internal combustion engines. Why? We need to wean ourselves of pollution. To recap, a livable city is a city that is safe and healthy and free of pollution. And the best way of achieving that is to have the explicit goal of reducing traffic. You might have heard me previously talk about light rail. And again, our best chance of getting there is when we agree that we need to reduce traffic. Thank you.
Hi everyone, um, I'm Claire Piper. Um, I've actually been working at Council for, um, for about 14 years now, um, which has been about the age of my eldest child who's 14 and I've got a young one who's uh, four years old. Both girls, and um, I didn't mean to fall into uh, a gender based approach to a lot of my work that I do or support, but it's kind of just ended up happening that way. Um, because I'm opinionated, I'm a town planner, and I think I can make a real difference. So. <laughs> it's, um, it's really neat to see so many people here. There's um, actually quite a lot of people here from women in urbanism. So um, big shout out to Frank. I didn't realise there were so many people here. That was great. So, um, but I'm here today to talk about women in urbanism, and I thought I'd just kind of quickly outline who we are and what we do. So we're a, a pretty amazing bunch of, of females, or anyone else that identifies as one. Uh, we are seeking to transform our towns and cities into more beautiful, inspiring and inclusive places for everyone. We do this by amplifying all of the voices and actions of self-identifying uh, Waitangi girls and non-binary people. We have six pretty amazing um, guiding principles, and I'm not going to read them out. You can go onto our website and have a look at and, and who we are and what we do. But as a collective of uh, supportive and empowering mana whenua and mana wahine here, across, and here and across Aotearoa, we've engaged in amazing events to help support and promote a gender lens on a whole bunch of issues, such as the need to increase women in local government. They're the ones that make the decisions on how our environments work out. So if we have more women in local government, we have a, a bit more of a, a go at getting a different view. Um, and we run campaigns such as the Stop Street and Public Harassment, so that was mainly done in Auckland. It was pretty good. I didn't realise actually when we ran that campaign how horrible it is for some females travelling on public transport around Auckland in particular. Um, and it was based on a similar um, campaign that was done here uh, with uh, racism um, that was after the terror attack. But in Ōtutahi we are 70 strong. And we encompass a wide range and uh, section of professions from myself, such as a, tra uh, a, a planner, a town planner, through to landscape architects, designers, uh, quite a lot of transport people actually, it's quite funny. Um, and, I, and I think when I think about the reason for that, it's because in that profession, there is a real lack of females. So in town planning, around about 50% of the profession is female, but in transport planning, it's only been about 25%. So that's pretty bad. So it's still a male-dominated um, profession. And so I think the, the reason why females would want to get together is to try and amplify our voices and create change. We host events for our network. We present at conferences to raise awareness. We've created a historical Women's on Bikes photo exhibition here in Otatahi. Um, it was pretty cool to see how women um, cycle around with all the frocks on and amazing stuff. And our new project for this year, uh, for us, is to fund uh, some public seating for the National Memorial for the Cape Shepherd. Now, the National Memorial is here in Christchurch, in Kahi, and there's no seating around it to take advantage of that amazing memorial. So, as a group of awesome women, we've decided we want some public seating so we can reflect and look at that fabulous sculpture. Um, and we want to do that by the 19th of September. Does anyone know what is important about the 19th of September? Election day. It is the election day, correct, but it's something else. It's also the suffrage, yeah. So actually it kind of um, blends really nicely. So when I asked um, the, the wider network, I was coming here today to speak on their behalf, what did they want me to talk about? Because I'm only a representative of many voices. So what does a healthy and accessible um, Otatahi look like? What, and what does it mean for women in urbanism? Well, it's all about equity, not equality, equity. It's equity of economic and transport policies. It's about disabilities and gender. It's about providing alternatives. It's not just cycling. It's having nice spaces to walk and be in and having access to good public transport. So that's been mentioned a couple of times, that's really good. 
It's about um, supporting our local government um, representatives to have all of the data that's needed to make good decisions um, and about increasing our professions in the end. So what, are we, what would we like to see in Ojitahi? We would love to see some next steps for the public transport. We would love the council to connect the major cycle routes to local networks and town centres so that as females we can get around and do what we need to do. Um, we'd love more bus shelters at stops so that we can be safe and protected. We'd love some of the routes, especially the key ones, to increase in frequency so we can get to where we want to get to without having to wait and transfer all the time, especially with kids and shopping. And we would love the Regional Council to have a look at the fees for the bus routes. Um, we, we support a whole bunch of um, other organisations um, with a shared view of tertiary students actually being identified as students so that they can have the student fear to travel on buses. And we think that will do it. Um, we're also really supportive of um, increasing more data and research into uh, females cycling, for example. It's really good to see that we've got females and males, but actually what about females with kids? Or a pram count, for example. Um, how many prams do you see going around? Um, we'd love our suburban um, footpaths to be wide enough to actually have prams and kids with, kids with us as we walk around our neighbourhoods, and you would have seen that in lockdown. I don't know about you, but sometimes I carry with me my sick of tears. <laughs> <laughs> and I lovingly give my neighbours hedges that front out into the um, footpath, a bit of a cut, um, and the back. <laughs> I heard you do the same. <laughs> um, but what we have to acknowledge is that not all women are the same. And uh, Julianne talked about that. So we can't have a one uh, size fits all for females or women um, in any of our transport planning or our infrastructure planning. We need to have a think about how different people move because we all move differently. So policy can be, be better informed by more gender specific research, allowing planners such as myself to have the evidence and data that better supports our decision makers for planning and um, strategies and infrastructure. We really need to think about effective links, um, convenient transport services, and having inviting and attractive routes, such as um, some of the sideways are really cool, some of them are pretty hardcore. Um, we want secure places to lock up our bikes. We want end of trip facilities. Um, we want showers and changing rooms. And in some cases here in Christchurch, when that has been mandated by the district plan, um, we have found that some of those businesses have run out of cycle parks. So we're not providing enough anyway. So that's kind of, we want more of them. We want, um, whilst you're providing, we are providing here separated sideways and street lighting, and that's really great, it makes us feel safe. We want well-designed and inclusive public places and behaviour change around that, so that we feel safe when we're there, when we get to the end point. So yeah, that's about us. I'm looking forward to some questions. <laughs> Thank you. Just for two minutes, do you mind just talking, turning to the person beside you and uh, thinking yourself about these questions? What are the questions that come out of this about what we want for an accessible and Healthy Christchurch, right? Healthy and accessible Christchurch. Just talk to each other for two minutes. Yeah. 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 People are really thinking hard to get uh, together again. <laughs> when, I think it's what you know. When uh, Rosalie thought, no, I'm not in the 90s, I'll be pleased. Not that many people will come and get a new way to it. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought it was quite strong. It's good to see it. It's good to see it. It's good to see it. Yeah. 
Regional Rail Plan, which we announced a couple, maybe about six weeks ago, or might have been two months ago. Um, and the idea is, how do we build on our existing rail network and start um, providing regional passenger services out of our largest cities that we can build upon in the future? And so um, we had a specific proposal um, from around Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch. Um, going all the way down to Timaru, actually, we could um, see a, a daily passenger service um, between Timaru and Christchurch, but of course, um, regional services uh, to Rangiora and Ralston, um, and making it quite frequent, I guess, is the key thing. And so, over a 10 year period, we thought with $9 billion, we could um, improve the stations, improve the tracks, and start to um, purchase some faster tilt trains, and you could actually get up to quite high speeds. Uh, just through kind of straightening tracks and making the, some double tracking, some passing loops, we could actually provide services, which would mean you had regular services and the longer ones would get up to 160 kilometers an hour. And that's a totally realistic proposal um, that uh, is a choice that New Zealand could make to invest in regional rail. Our, sometimes, some, most of you probably won't care about this, but some... <laughs> Some people say, oh, we have narrow gauge in New Zealand. That means we can't have, our rail services can't be fast. But in fact, uh, Queensland and Japan have trains running at 160 kilometers an hour on exactly the same gauge. The only reason we don't have this in New Zealand is because no government has had the leadership to say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to develop our regional rail services. Um, and there are huge economic benefits they create, it creates more jobs per dollar spent than spending on motorways. And of course, once you have those regional rail services, um, it reduces the need for people to own as many cars, to drive as many cars, and that saves households and businesses money, which they can then spend on more things in the local economy. And it will reduce carbon emissions, which is essential. Woo! One of the, I don't want to say Shaman Reedy, is that one of the investment ready projects that's been put forward by our parties <laughs> yes. to have the, happen? The Green Party has put it forward as a longer term project, not a shovel ready one. There are some track improvements that can be done immediately and that have been put forward as shovel ready, um, particularly around Wellington and Auckland. Um, I think Christchurch is wouldn't have been as well developed and so uh, we would have to start the work on that now but it is something we could realistically achieve within a few years but i should say the government is not one that has gotten government funding or approval yet this is something the green party will be campaigning on if the government doesn't agree to it Woo! could free buses work or um yes Free buses could work. There are some good reasons to retain some aspects of fares because you can provide more services and you can target uh, free free services to people who really need it, like people <coughs> excuse me <coughs> with a community services card. Children, I think under the age of eighteen would be really good. Um, I think what I would like to see us go towards is something where you have a, a transport card. 
and that you use that, you pay sort of a weekly or a monthly fee and you get unlimited public transport. And that we put, some people would pay for theirs, like people like me who you know earn a decent salary and are working age. Um, and that that would provide enough revenue that we'd be able to keep up a hot, I mean, frequency is the most important thing to making a public transport service viable and useful for people. The more frequent it is, the better the connections, the more people use it, the better it is, the more revenue you raise, and the more services you can continue to provide. Why should the work be revenue-based? Um, well, I think you do need some revenue to run transport services. Um, you could just run it through, uh, you know, pay for it out of the general consolidated fund, but it'll always be competing with hospitals and teachers and schools and things like that. So, you, and that's okay, you know. But I think that um, it's also useful to have uh, people who can pay able to pay because then you can differentiate between longer trips and off peak and on peak and things like that. But yeah. But I, I think the public transport should be far more frequent, it should be far more affordable in New Zealand, the fare should be much lower, and for many people it should be free, especially children and people in community service. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Harold. No first questions for anyone else. Um, so we have a lot of new money going into roads, a lot of investment in roads. So how are we future planning public transport or cycleways when we build all those new roads? Oh, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so some of the projects that were announced in the New Zealand upgrade, for example, are some highway projects, and we've ensured that they're going to have uh, full provision of separated cycleways and where it's appropriate high occupancy vehicle lanes or bus lanes. But there's no question that we'd be better off putting the money just into the parts of the transport system that we have under invested in and that will get the best outcome on the road network as well. So if it were up to me, you know, we'd be putting all of the new capital investment into public transport, regional rail, um, making our streets complete. That means proper footpaths, proper crossings, proper cycleways, um, and really enabling people many choices about how they get around. I have a question about, um, my experience is that the more I've cycled, the less I've bust. And is, is, that, is there much research about the loss of public transport as cycling has gone up? Um, look, uh, maybe... Can everyone see me if I sit down? Yeah, sure. It's popping up and down. Um, they complement each other really well. And if you have a you know, really well-run public transport system, then you can take buses on it. A rail, passenger rail and bikes go really well together. And when you combine them, that means people can travel much further and be much more flexible about where they're going than if you just rely on bikes or just rely on public transport. But bicycles for short trips can also really take the pressure off your public transport. And so, you know, in, uh, I'm just going to pick my favorite town in Germany. I think it'll be Axel's favorite town too. Freiburg in Baden-Württemberg. So their mode split would be something like 25% um, of people take public transport. 80% of their public transport is uh, light rail. And then they've also got buses that feed it and they have regional rail. Um, somewhere between 30 and 50% of all of their trips are by bicycle and walking. And then it would be about 22% by car. So that sort of split is really well balanced and that's kind of what you get to when you don't only invest in car travel. Question up back there, who's got the right? Isn't what I really need to persuade. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's why I'm here, sorry. Sorry. This then what's really needed. We'll, we'll just go over here first. To, um, I'll bring it back over to this we'll, we'll start over here. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, driverless autonomous cars, what's the government's vision for using those for like ride share or reducing the number of cars that are currently in New Zealand at the moment? Um, I think that, that when autonomous cars become a real thing, and I don't think they're very close to being a real thing. I mean, they, they are in the sense that you can buy a Tesla that can pretty much drive itself. 
but you'd have to get to a different point in the technology for it to truly be driverless. You still need someone sitting in the driver's seat, really, in those driverless cars. So let's say that's like 10, 15 years away, I think, at earliest. Then I, I do think that once you move from a private ownership model of cars to one where you're just using a car in your toolkit of transport, and you just pay for your car trips when you have them, then it's going to support much higher use of public transport, walking and cycling. Because the current reason we have less walking and cycling in public transport is because the cost of car ownership is sunk. And once you own the car, the, the, each trip you take, the cost of that seems very small. But if you just pay, if you were actually paying, you know, the ownership cost and as a variable cost, like you do when you do public transport, um, it's pretty obvious that taking public transport is way cheaper than driving your own car, and way cheaper uh, for the community than every car needing to be parked. So, sorry, this is getting very jargony. I'm sorry. I'll go back to my high level stuff. But look, autonomous vehicles, I think, will support a city where you don't have to own a car, you get access to a car when you need it, and that means we can give the streets in the inner city over to more walking and cycling, and we can have public transport. It's all going to work much better. Cool. Thanks, Julie. Okay. Is there a way to introduce an effective congestion charge that dissuades people from driving into town, into the city, but doesn't leave the city as a donut? Um, yes, yeah, certainly the places that have introduced congestion charging have not become donuts, you know, uh, but that's only about five cities in the world so far. So that's Stockholm, City of London, Singapore, uh, Milan, and Gothenburg, I think. Um, and those cities already had much higher levels of public transport, walking and cycling, higher population and employment density and um, higher cost of parking, like way higher cost of parking, so, and a smaller supply of parking. So, so I think that the congestion charging may have a place in New Zealand, but the first thing we have to do is supply a lot more public transport, a lot more public transport priority, and a lot more provision of safe cycle lanes, and allow more density of development in the inner city, because density has been discouraged by city planning rules, it's actually been prevented from happening, and we're actually uh, working on a really lovely, um, some pretty exciting policies, which I hope will be announced in the next few weeks, that will help uh, allow more housing and you know, more jobs to be provided within their urban areas in a way that is high quality, high amenity, and then we'll see you know, fewer people choosing to own cars, and then you can start charging for congestion, and um, you know, people who want to pay for it can pay for it, and you use the revenue to provide better public transport as Queenstown has done. I'm talking so much. <laughs> You've got the microphone. Oh, who was the question? Oh, she put up her hand. So, in terms of zero carbon by 2050, I'm kind of looking over there at the chair of the Climate Change Commission. <laughs> 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 And Christchurch by 2045. In terms of transport, the decisions that we're making in the next year, five years, ten years, where a lot of those are investments that will still be around in 2045 and 50. What is the view on how we get there in terms of a zero carbon transport into the domestic sector? So. I guess on electrification of AM because we're so high right now on renewable electricity. And I don't see any vision or plan for either Christchurch or New Zealand. Quite enjoying Vision Week at the moment. Uh, there's some interesting things out there. But what what's the plan? What's the view? What's the policy? What are the things that we're putting forward today when we've got voting in a few months that we go, yeah. Talk about first. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's really important. You're right. I think transport is going to have to do more than any other sector for us to achieve those goals, which means we have to decarbonize transport in the next 10 years. 10 years? I'm waiting. You, yeah, that's what I thought. 10 years. Yeah. 53, yeah. 53, yeah. That's okay. And the only way to do that is um, an absolute revolution in everything we're doing. 
I mean, we need Copenhagen, Copenhagen levels of cycling. Um, we need much higher public transport use. We need alternative fuels for heavier vehicles. And we need uh, electrification of the light vehicle fleet. Uh, more greens and government would help. <laughs> The other week, I, I wrote a policy paper. It's a one pager, but I haven't actually published it yet uh, because I'm not quite sure what to do with it. But it's basically, um, I'm, I'm basically expanding on the premise of what would happen if, as a country, we decided that we just simply do not import internal combustion engine light vehicles any longer. And and whilst it, it has a very um, you know, it's very lovely to get rid of our emissions. The reason I wrote it is from, a, from an economic perspective. We are sending five to six billion dollars each year overseas to buy crude oil. That is money that just leaves the country. If we took some investment and got uh, our electricity generation higher, um, invested something in, in systems, uh, which is called piped, uh, pumped hydro, um, which gives us year-round electricity supply. And if we invest a lot of money into charging stations, that sounds like a job creation scheme, doesn't it? Um, that would enable us to say, we will simply not import internal combustion engines any longer. And back of the envelope, uh, year one, that's, that saves us 250 million in money we sent overseas to buy um, crude oil. Year two, 500 million. Year three, three quarters of a billion. And, and it goes up, so based on the, uh, how often we turn the uh, vehicle fleet over. So I'm not quite sure what I'll do with this uh, 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 paper, but uh, I think I'll publish it somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll add into that, we heard the, the guy who has electric planes here in Christchurch talking about how, something I'd never realised, I used to live near Marsden Point, but how much electricity goes to making that crude oil into petrol. It's a phenomenal, I, I can't remember the slip, but you should add it as a paragraph to your paper, because it is huge. He says we don't process that, we have this electric capacity. Uh, so. Because of the COVID situation, I think uh, New Zealand is ready for a science-based approach to tackling the issues. Uh, so my question is, uh, and also because we're also having this referendum on cannabis, for example, there are papers about the pros and cons that people can weigh up the advantages and disadvantages of it. Don't you think the helmet law has to be considered as well? It's less contentious than cannabis, I think would help women and create safer streets. And also, I just wanted to add um, strict liability law, which is also missing from the topic, which is very important for people to feel safe. It's not just about the cars out there, it's about knowing that if they got hit, someone will be responsible and it's not them. And uh, what do you think, and how do you think the Greens can push that forward? Thank you. From a cycle uh, shop owner. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I'm not sure the helmet thing is less contentious than cannabis. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I agree with you on that. Um, but I, look, I, I actually was talking to the Ministry of Transport Chief Science Advisor earlier this week, and he asked me, would you like me to write something about the science on helmets? And I said, yes, that would be really useful. Go um, Oh yeah, he's here. Yeah. I saw him. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you were going to talk to the chief science advisor from health as well too about that. Great. You're going to talk to each other, and I'm going to do some work. <laughs> oh, sorry. And your second question was about strict liability law. I did look into this early on when I was at MP, and. Um, my understanding from the Netherlands is that they didn't introduce strict liability until they had 
more cycle infrastructure and a higher numbers of people cycling. And so that was the way that I thought we would go, is try to get the infrastructure in there, get the safe speeds, um, particularly starting around schools and town centers, um, get more people cycling, and then you know we can start to look at more changes. The accessible streets consultation that NZTA has been running, which probably won't, we probably won't be able to get policy decisions on that before the election. It does introduce some changes like a minimum overtaking distance for all vulnerable road users um, of at least a meter, 1.5 meters on um, roads with a speed of higher than 60 kilometers an hour. And um, it also, yeah, I think, I think that we decided that it also changes some of the rules around priority on side streets for people who are walking and cycling so cars have to give way to them if you've got um, certain markings there. And um, I, would, I totally agree with you and I see where we need to go. I just think we need to take the steps in the right order to get there. And the last question today, unfortunately, we've got... Okay. Um, and I thought it should be quick. Uh, I'm interested in how much uh, we should be prioritising land use planning over transport planning because I sort of look at what trips we should be making and if we're wanting more walking and cycling, they should be the shorter trips, you know, e-bikes and public transport notwithstanding. So how much do we do that to encourage those local trips? How do we do it? Well, my position has always been let's make it easier to provide those things closer to where people live. And as many of you have listened to me talk rabbit on about this for at least a decade. Um, there are a bunch of barriers and district planning rules that make it really difficult or even impossible to provide shops and homes um, in close proximity to other things. So I think that the single, single biggest thing we need to do is get those rules out of the way. Um, you can't really zone for and force businesses to be in certain places, but I think you can get the barriers out of the way, um, like the minimum parking requirements or some of the really strict zoning that says it has to only be residential in this area and only uh, commercial in another area. Allowing more mixed use allows people to access many things in close proximity to their home. And Kiwi Build, uh, not Kiwi Build, um, Housing New Zealand Kainoora, um, we have a huge investment in state housing and we also have an urban development um, authority bill that's about to go through and the idea is to leverage kind of the power of central government to provide a lot of public housing affordable housing and we want to do that in a way that is um, modeling best practice as was done in at Hobsonville point in auckland and yeah. i think that that proves what you can do although it was missing the public housing side of it after uh, the government changed but um, I think we, in other countries that do this well, central and local government are far more involved in um, allowing the community to feed into structure plans and development plans, and I think New Zealand should go, should follow them down that track. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic questions. Thank you very much. It's been amazing. Um, we're not, um, this is organised by the parliamentary side of um, government, uh, and I can probably just do a, a slight thing that if you are interested in the Green Party, there are some people here who belong to the Green Party. Hands up or out some of those people. There you go, if you want to look around. So if you're interested in knowing more, have a talk to them. But thank you all for your participation, and thank you to um, Axel and Claire and Julianne. Um, there is a gig happening at 7, that's why we're going to um, stop, we're going to have a gun here. Sorry, the screen just fell off. Okay, the screen just fell off, don't worry. I'll say it myself. But, um, so I'll finish with Karakia and we'll do a yee after that. Kia whakairia te tapu. Kia wātia ai te ara. Kia turuku. Fakataha ai, kia turuki, fakataha ai, humiye, huye, tarahimiye. Restrictions are moved aside so the pathway is clear to return to everyday activities. Hey, let's hear it for these people.